Twelve, and that comports generally Asian history. So, uh, if, any, if anyone is interested in, um, you know, whether that be uh, an education program or education students um, in field trips or the education materials that we have here, uh, please feel free to uh, jump on the website at bchs.gov and um, go on the education tab. Uh, there, you're free to chat with me or the other educators here at the Urban Historical Society um, to set up any kind of education program site or resources that are appropriate for the So, I just wanted to kind of let you know and we're uh, really here to help. And uh, we're kind of the, the ones that are um, facing the community and kind of get the partnerships going and, and help out in the way we can. So, um, just going to let you guys know, and I'll go ahead and introduce uh, David, uh, and he is the uh, VP of Education, Exhibits, and Publication. So, David, go ahead and uh, come on up. Well, thank you all for getting with me today. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about the Historical Society. We're incredibly excited for tonight's program taking place here at the Arizona Heritage Center at Top. As well as streaming online for audience watching from home. The mission of the Arizona Historical Society is connecting people to the power of Arizona's history. Program at our museums across the state and in the digital realm. We are grateful to partner with the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies at Arizona State University to bring Dr. Maurice Crandall here to the Arizona Heritage Center for his presentation about the meanings and legacies of the Alibi and Apache Scouts. We at the Arizona Historical Society have enjoyed working with Dr. Crandall on several recent projects, including an article he wrote for our quarterly publication, Urban Arizona History. His recent article, Yabahu, Yabahai History and Misrepresentation in Arizona's Indigenous Landscape, was part of a special state of the field issue we published last year. He also moderated a panel for us last year, a virtual program, uh, and we're also looking forward to working with him on uh, several forthcoming projects in the next couple of years. Thank you again for joining us this evening. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Richard D. Perry. School of Historical and Philosophical and Religious Studies at ASU. Thank you, David. Good evening, everyone. I'm Richard Kane and I direct uh, Arizona State University School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies, which is a unit of the uh, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. I'd like to welcome all of you this evening, and to do so, mindful of the fact that we gather on a land. Thus, we begin with an acknowledgement of an as of yet unrectified injustice. The School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies acknowledges that it is located on the ancestral lands of indigenous nations. We thank the native communities of the Salt River Valley, including the Kapamir Oodans, Pima, and Kiposh, Maricopa nations who have inhabited this place for centuries, and whose stewardship of the land and waterways allows us to be here today. Recognizing, however, that land acknowledgments alone are not enough, Shippers is committed to supporting our native students and community by promoting the learning of history, philosophy, and religion, creating a learning environment where native students can succeed and thrive, and collaborating with indigenous nations in the region to protect native sovereignty, governance, and jurisdiction of their territories. I'd like to extend a special welcome to those who are joining us uh, today online. I think we have about 130 uh, people attending remotely. Uh, you're welcome. It's my privilege to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Maurice S. Crandall, uh, someone for whom many of you need uh, no introduction. 
Uh, Maurice is an assistant professor of Native American Studies at Dartmouth College and also Shippers is a distinguished visiting scholar. A citizen of the Yavapai Apache Nation of Camp Verde, Dr. Crandall is a prize winning historian whose work explores indigenous sovereignty and borderlands history. His first book, These People Have Always Been a Republic. Indigenous electorates in the U.S. Mexico borderlands, 1598 to 1912, was published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2019 and was awarded the 2020 Cooley Western History Association Prize, the 2020 David J. Weber Clements Prize, the 2020 Southwest Book Award, and an honorable mention to the 2020 Ernie Mueller Herkeline Book Award. Uh, this evening, Dr. Crandall will be speaking to us on the topic of his current book project, uh, History of the Apache Scouts. His talk is entitled Tiger of the Human Species, Gatify Apache Scouts, Meanings and Legacies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Maurice Crandall. Right, Tabate, Mahamjiga Gamuje, Hanigam. Thank you, Ahie, for all of you coming tonight. Um, it's good to be here in Arizona. And uh, Richard, I'm going to give you a little bit of a hard time just for the future. It's uh, Akimel Atam people. So, just just FYI for you. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> I I want to start with um, a little story. A few years ago. When I was reading the tribal newspaper, the Ganava Yati, which is the Yavapai Apache Nation newspaper, uh, there was a there was an article about a, a basketball tournament. And if you, I mean, if you know anything about basketball and Native people, you know that basketball is huge, right? And we, there's res ball, and everybody sort of heard of it. And um, there was a Netflix series about it recently. And if uh, you know, Steve Nash and Mike D'Antoni did seven seconds or less offense, like res ball is four seconds or less offense. It's like super quick run and gun, lots of back and forth on the court. But um, what struck me about this uh, article wasn't the tournament. It's, I mean, it wasn't the basketball itself. It was, it was a certain element. So it was a tournament of tribal council teams. So the, the teams were made up of tribal council members who are sometimes quite elderly and sometimes, you know, younger. And um, my mom was chair at the time and uh, she was designated as a cheerleader because she's, she said she didn't know how to dribble a ball. She actually referred to it as she didn't know how to bounce a ball. So that tells you she know it's called dribbling. So um, she didn't play, but, you know, some of the players were really good. There were people who had grown up playing in high school and um, good players and, the, and they'd have the tournament at Akchen because they have good facilities down there. And, um, but what specifically got me was the teams and they were reporting on the teams and there are, uh, you know, each team sort of has a mascot and a name for their team. And so uh, I, I brought this today because it, this was in the article and then I, I got a hold of this shirt from my mom. So I'm gonna embarrass her again. So here's her, her jersey with her name, you know, Russell Wineski. But then what caught my attention is that the team name is the, the Fighting Scouts. You can see that there, Fighting Scouts, the Yavapai Apache Nation Tribal Council Fighting Scouts. And uh, I can honestly say that that was the genesis of my project, that I thought scouts, so why would uh, the team choose scouts as their mascot and fighting scouts no less? Um, and so as I started to think about that, uh, it, it sort of led me to various aspects of um, uh, what scouts mean to Apache and Yavapai communities, because both scouted in, in large numbers. Um, and that was uh, what really inspired this project. And it's been um, going forward since then, because that tournament was probably two or three years ago. And that's, that's how long I've been thinking about this. So first, let me tell you what this is not. Um, this is not a talk today uh, about the um, kind of Western lore element. A lot of you are probably familiar with people like Alchese and, and um, Mickey Free or the Apache Kid. Uh, I'm not talking about that sort of Western lore aspect and, and the, the 
the Apache Wars, as they're called. Um, all of that is interesting, but I'm, I'm not a military historian. And as much as I, I find, you know, Al Sieber and, and Colonel Gatewood and all these people interesting, that's not what I want to talk about today. Um, instead, I want to ask questions like, why did Apaches and Yavapai scout? What motivated them? Um, what uh, led them to this activity? Um, what did it mean to them at the time, but then also later? Um, I'm interested in what happened in these communities to these men after they had scouted in the, the decades after the Indian Wars. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the quote for the title of the talk is it comes from uh, General Crook. And some of you might have already known that. Um, George Crook said, we have before us the tiger of the human species. Um, and, and Crook, you know, you could define him as a, uh, an Apache file. I mean, the guy loved, Apache. he was enamored with Apaches. That's, that's uh, Alchese, his kid later, William Alchese, who won a Congressional Medal of Honor um, for the winter campaign in the early 1870s with Crook. Uh, but, but Crook loved Apaches and he loved his scouts in particular. And he had a lot of good things to say about them. Uh, and so, you know, that's where the, the quote comes from, but I want to sort of separate the myth from the reality um, and, and look at this in a little more detail. Uh, I have family members and, and tribal members here today, and it's not an exaggeration to say that probably all of us have scout ancestors. All of us have um, someone in our, in our family line that was a scout. Uh, and, and I defer to those community members and that community knowledge, really. Um, I wouldn't claim to be the expert that knowledge within the community is, is uh, the most important. So I wanna, I wanna say that. Um, first, I wanna give a little bit of historical context. Uh, the use of native soldiers and scouts in particular, it's as old as colonialism. Um, from the first time Europeans came to this uh, hemisphere, they started using indigenous people in their military, in their armies, and, and in conquest. Um, you know, the, the Spaniards used allies in central Mexico against um, the, the Aztec peoples, uh, as, as many of you are familiar with. Um, Juan Bautista de Anza in New Mexico used scouts um, and uh, native soldiers to defeat the Comanches um, in the 18th century, and then required Comanches to provide soldiers and campaigns against Navajos. So <laughs> the cycle kept repeating itself. Um, and, you know, Spain used uh, various soldiers, Navajos included, against Western Apaches in their campaigns. So this has been going on for a long time. In addition, some of you may not know, but in, in 1776, when the Declaration of Independence was signed, uh, referring to the merciless Indian savages, Congress passed uh, an act that same year, um, allowing George Washington to raise 2,000 native soldiers to use uh, in the Revolutionary War. And in every American conflict from, and even before that, from the, from the French and Indian War, through the Revolution, through the War of 1812, through the Civil War, um, all of these conflicts, Native American soldiers and scouts in particular were used from many indigenous nations. Um, but in New Mexico, a little bit closer to home, and I'm gonna put my glasses on so I can read a little bit better. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Philip St. George Crook, uh, or sorry, Cook of the Mormon Battalion fame, campaigned against Hickory Apaches and Utes in New Mexico and Colorado and used a, referred to them as a spy company of Taos Pueblo soldiers uh, in the 1840s and 1850s. And, and they found them to be quite effective. Now in Arizona, things really started to change during the Civil War. This is the time when um, both Tana Atam and, and Akimel Atam, as well as Pipash, Maricopa peoples, uh, were used as scouts and allies by the United States. And they were largely used to fight Yavapais and Apaches, uh, my people. And the United States was, was using traditional enmity between these groups and, and using it to their advantage. Um, and as the Civil War uh, continued into the 1860s and Arizona became a, ter a territory of its own, um, they commissioned five militia companies, including Company B, which was Maricopas, and Company C of Pimas. Company C was commanded by a guy by the name of uh, John D. Walker, who was part Wyandotte, and he liked to dress in a, in a breech cloth for dramatic effect, you know, and sort of play it up, play Indian. Um, 
those companies of Pima and Maricopa Scouts served uh, into 1866 when the regular army returned to Arizona. And 1866 is an important year for the military here and for scouts in particular. 1866 is when uh, Congress passed an act that um, it aimed at a, a variety of military reforms. One of them was that there was a clause uh, that authorized the president to enlist a force of Indians, quote, not to exceed 1,000. And they were to act as scouts and in addition, they would receive regular army pay. So they were paid as regular soldiers were uh, in, in the cavalry or whatever regular army units. Um, they could be discharged whenever their services were no longer needed. So they could raise them and then discharge them after a short time. They didn't have to serve multi-year enlistments like regular army soldiers. And uh, that provision took effect August 1st, 1866. And it's important because it allowed for short-term enlistments. So scouts, could serve for a matter of weeks, months, and then go back home, um, which most of them liked, like preferred to do. Uh, and they could go back to their families and their communities. Um, so I don't wanna go any further also without explaining what scouting is. Some of you might know, but you might not know. Um, scouting traditionally meant reconnaissance duties, discovering and following the enemy, trailing uh, an enemy, locating where they were, locating their camps, their communities, uh, determining their strength, uh, determining who a, an enemy tribe was or if they were actually friendly um, to, the, to the army. And up until this time, a lot of conventional wisdom was that scouts shouldn't engage in battle, that they should only be scouts in the sense of, of uh, discovering the enemy and its position and its strength and those types of things. But the reality was that in the Yavapai and Apache Wars in Arizona in the 1870s through the 1890s, scouts engaged in combat a lot. Um, and they fought both alongside regular soldiers, but also independently on their own, they would engage with uh, groups that they had tracked down. And uh, so getting back to those, those years after the Civil War, when Major John Green of the 1st U.S. Cavalry and an Apache chief that whites referred to as Miguel brokered a peace uh, along the White River in the summer of 1869, it led to the establishment of Fort Apache. Um, and this can be seen as sort of the beginning of significant U.S. Apache joint warfare because um, the army started from that point recruiting White Mountain Apache scouts initially, and then from, from other Apache and then Yavapai groups as well. Uh, when George Crook was sent to Arizona to command the Department of Arizona in 1871, he ramped up the use of Indian scouts. Um, they were his preferred scouts. Uh, and in particular, like I said, Apaches and Yavapais. Um, his main goal was to subdue uh, these groups. And he initially used whatever scouts he could get his hands on. Um, and some people know, some don't know that th uh, there were Autumn scouts and Peeposh, but there were also uh, Wallapai scouts. Um, and then there were Apache and Yavapai scouts. Um, but they, they liked uh, Apache and Yavapai scouts the best. They found them the, the most effective. Um, and Crook really came to appreciate Apache scouts so much that, uh, like I said, it's not inaccurate to say that he was, a, he was an Apache file, um, which is ironic since his job was to kill Apaches. You know, how could this guy love what he, I mean, that's sort of the history of the United States and native people, you know, there's an enamored, but then also bent on uh, genocide and annihilation. Uh, and my, my title comes again from a quote from Crook, uh, which he gave in 1886 in the Journal of the United States Military Institution of the United States. It's kind of a long title. Um, he also said that Apaches were, quote, the most thoroughly individualized soldiers on the globe, that each was an army in himself, waiting for orders from no superiors, thoroughly confident in his own judgment, and never at a loss to know when to attack or when to retreat. You know, that's, that's high praise. Um, Crook named his mule, which you can see him on here, uh, Apache. Um, and actually the use of mule trains was one of Crook's uh, innovations that helped him defeat Apaches and Yavapai people because mules are more sure-footed in the territory where our people were, which is mountainous and lots of canyons and steep, uh, difficult terrain. And, and mules are better than horses and they can bear a better load um, with, with sure feet. And so he used mule trains. So it was mules and scouts really that helped him uh, uh, win these wars. Uh, and again, his most trusted scout was, was William Alchese. And uh, I'll talk about him a little bit more later. But one thing that I wanna say is that Apache 
although they, they sort of get the most attention. And when we say Apache scouts, we really need to say Yavapai Apache scouts because Yavapai is scouted in large numbers as well. Um, and you know, the, the, the army sometimes didn't even distinguish Yavapais and Apaches. They called Yavapais Mojave Apaches or Yuma Apaches. And so that they were sort of lumped into one group. Um, so like I was saying, it's not my intention to give a, a full history of scout actions during the, the Indian Wars. Um, they've gotten a lot of attention from Western history buffs and they're, they're part of this lore. Um, but that's also not to say that scouts didn't prove their worth. They absolutely did. Um, very early on in Crook's tenure in Arizona, for example, 22 Congressional Medals of Honor were awarded for actions during the infamous Tonto Basin campaign of 1872 to 73, which was fought mainly against Yavapai and, and Dilgeya Apaches, uh, my ancestors. And 10 of those Medals of Honor went to scouts, including Will, William Alchese, uh, who served as a Sergeant of Scouts. Um, speaking to the New York Herald in 1883, Cook said, Crook said, the Apaches are the shrewdest and best fighters in the world. Um, now, while praise of the scouts wasn't universal, there were some naysayers. Uh, there were some who, who thought that they weren't trustworthy, that they weren't honest. Generally, if you read the accounts from the officers who served with scouts, to, to a man, they say the scouts were honest and that they were, they were great fighters. In fact, um, you know, Al Sieber and Gatewood and John Burke uh, had positive, positive things to say. And in particular, I want to read a quote from Burke who said, the longer we knew the Apache scouts, the better we liked them. They were wilder and more suspicious than the Pimas and Maricopas, but far more reliable and endowed with a greater amount of courage and daring. I never knew an officer whose experience entitled his opinion to the slightest consideration who did not believe as I do on this subject. Um, so take that for whatever it's worth. So here is where I stop with this sort of um, army perspective on the scouts and get more into the indigenous perspective that comes from our communities. Um, and focusing on understanding the legacies of the scouts, is, it's not easy, it's difficult. And partly it's because um, it's a question that while it's fascinating, it's one that also is uh, tied up with um, pain and trauma within our communities. And I wanna uh, put up a quote from my uncle Vincent Randall, who is the, Apache culture director and, and a, a Dilje Apache elder. And, and this is what he said. He said, it's not a pleasant subject with us. Although it is of great interest to the general public and gets lots of attention as a noble cause, it was action brought on by necessity. When I was growing up, my elders did not like to talk about scouts and what they had done. Like death, they did not like to talk about it. We know if one of our ancestors was a scout, but nobody ever talked about it. It is a sad episode in our history and the old timers really wanted to forget about it. When a man's enlistment was up and the wars were over, the family would do an enemy way ceremony. So all the business was in the past. It didn't exist anymore. And for our people, that is the way it stays. So personally, I approach this subject again with respect for the elders who, who have passed on, for these people who served as scouts, for their descendants, for us. Um, and to keep in mind that while this is an interesting subject for many, it's also a, a painful subject. And uh, we, need to, we need to remember that it's tied in with, with trauma and with the, the subjugation of our people and the death of our, our relatives and our ancestors. Um, but that exists in tension with the fact that all of us have scout ancestors. Um, Vincent also said, almost everyone at Payson and Camp Verde had an ancestor who was a scout for the army. Um, so uh, while it's a painful episode in our history, it's, it's also one that occupies um, a prominent place. And it, for the last few years has, has occupied a, a big part of my headspace. Um, and there are others who are doing this work as well. I'm not the only one. A uh, number of books have been, have been published about, for example, the events at Sibiq, where this, you know, the, the so-called scout mutiny, where scouts went against the army when they tried to capture a, a, an Apache holy man, and there was fighting between them, and, and some scouts were arrested and, and later hanged. Um, and there have been other projects involved with scouts. Um, but through all this, for me, the central question has been, why did so many of our ancestors do it? Uh, Crook intentionally recruited scouts from among Yavapai and Apache groups that had just been defeated and subjugated or, or had come in and surrendered. And so um, the most negative analysis could be, well, scouts were uh, traitors to their people. And, and you know, some people might say that. Um, 
and it was you know maybe a deep form of betrayal but that kind of analysis doesn't take into consideration some really important points that i want to talk about um, one crucial consideration is what Dilje apaches from the verde valley and yavapais refer to as the promise and uh, some of you might know about this uh, it's actually two promises so when crook started to fight against the people in the Tonto Basin and in the Mogollon Rim country and in the Verde Valley. They eventually put them on a reservation, which was, it was called the Rio Verde Reserve. And um, it was a stretch of land about uh, you know, 40, 40 miles by 20, it was like 800 square miles essentially. And it, uh, it was where our people who had been defeated were placed on this, on this Rio Verde Reserve. And the promise was, now that you're on this reservation, which today is around, uh, it's actually around Cottonwood and Clarkdale, um, more so than, than Camp Verde in that area. But um, the promise was, if you stay on this reservation, if you behave and be good Indians, farm, uh, they are already knew how to farm. You know, it's not a big secret there, but our people already farmed for a long time. But the government is saying, well, we'll teach you how to farm. Um, but the, the promise was, if you do all this and, and are good, then you can stay here forever but this will be your land. And it was created through an executive order. Um, and so we did that. We farmed, we, we put a lot of land under cultivation. We built uh, canals and, and agricultural works and were very successful and actually ended up supplying Fort Whipple over by Prescott and the, the fort at, at Camp Verde. Uh, but we did too good. And so the suppliers who were mostly based in Tucson that supplied all the commodities to the reservations got mad and said, we're losing our contracts. And so they said, we want all Apaches and Yavapais on one reservation, and that was San Carlos. And so in 1875, that reservation right there, Rio Verde Reserve, was just erased through another executive order. And in February of 1875, that first promise that we could stay there was broken, and our people were rounded up again and sent south to uh, San Carlos Reservation. And it was a forced march and it was during winter and we had to cross over rivers and a lot of our people died and there was fighting along the way and it was a, a really horrible episode. Um, but what's interesting is even as this was going on, just, just before the, the forced march of our people to San Carlos, our people were scouting for Crook. Um, in 1874, uh, there was a, a company, Lieutenant Schuyler, who was, uh, there in the, in the area. He recruited, for example, um, a, a group of uh, Yavapais specifically who, who were used in a campaign. And so even as all of this was going on, our people were scouting for the, for the US Army. Uh, and, that, and it's really because partially we wanted to force the army to, be, um, to keep their promise that we could stay there. And scouting was seen as one of those activities that would help um, preserve our land uh, and that we could stay on that land. But, no matter, we were moved uh, down to San Carlos in 1875. So the, the promise was made again. And Crook, who had to go back on his word, said to our people, hey, if you're good at San Carlos, and if you farm, and if you do everything that you're supposed to do, including scouting for the army, then we'll let you go back to the Verde Valley. And Crook actually said you could go back in maybe five to 10 years. Just be good, keep a low profile down here, don't get into trouble, do what we ask you to do, and then we'll let you go back. Uh, and so again, our people did what they could, even though San Carlos is a, for us is a foreign environment and it's not an easy place to, to grow things. I mean, it's not a, a easy environment to, uh, to farm and do those things. And, and they also congregated many groups who weren't, who weren't friendly on friendly terms with each other. Yavapais, Apaches, different bands, because the army thought, well, they're all Indians. They can just all live together in one reservation, but that, that wasn't the case. But again, we did what we were asked to do and uh, that second promise wasn't fulfilled for a long time. Uh, it wasn't five or 10 years, it was actually 25 years. So between 1875 and 1900, our people, our Yavapai and Delje Apaches from the Verde Valley were kept at San Carlos. And it wasn't until things started to sort of calm down after the Geronimo Wars uh, and those campaigns in the 1880s and up through about 1890, uh, that they then sort of loosened uh, the restrictions on our people when we started to file back into that area. But one thing to, to consider in this is, you know, this is our homeland. This is a photo I took uh, 
a little bit outside of uh, Cottonwood, so looking at Mingus Mountain. This is you know, our traditional lands there. Um, scouting wasn't something that when you, when you volunteered to serve as a scout, it's not like you were in the field the entire time. There were sometimes weeks or months of downtime. You weren't always out chasing renegade bands. And uh, if you were a scout in the army, you often were based out of Fort Verde, which is right there in your homeland. So imagine if you're a scout for a few months enlistment, maybe six months, maybe less, you're right there in your home territory. And you might be in the field some of the time, but you're, you're in your homeland. And this is an opportunity that people back at San Carlos didn't have. So that had to be a motivator as well. You got to be in uh, your lands and your familiar territory. Whereas people back at San Carlos, um, even those who went and tried to pick acorns, for example, if they went outside the reservation boundaries, they could be labeled renegades and, and shot just for, for trying to um, find things to, to sustain them. Uh, but our people, um, they, they, they did the best they could. Uh, and I think whatever opportunities they had to be back in the homelands and, and retain that connection to lands, if scouting was part of that, I think that that, uh, that was a, a consideration. Um, a second argument that I've heard articulated a number of times, and you've probably heard this as well, is that in Arizona in the 1870s, when it's tra uh, transitioning quickly into a cash economy, a wage economy, where people you know, get jobs, uh, that scouting was uh, a job and that Native people understood this. And so they, they went into scouting as sort of an avocation and it, it became their employment. And so you get, this is Mike Burns, who was a scout for a number of years, but, but you see sort of the, the smart uniform and sort of the look there. Um, and scouting did provide a salary, steady money when you were scouting. It provided tools, it provided access to clothing, commissary stores where you could get resources that then would help your family. Um, all of that is true, but I wanna point out a, a few things. Um, First, the literature frames scout service as something so revolutionary uh, that scout re scouts like realized they would get paid almost like you know, shiny coins. Oh my gosh, I do this, then I, I get this, uh, this reward. Um, and I, that idea sort of makes me cringe because it, it says that native people are so primitive that they didn't understand that work could bring a, re a reward. And that's not true. Everyone knows that. Um, first of all, if you look back historically, some Western Apache groups, particularly those who lived around Tucson and in the Southern part of Arizona, they'd been involved in a regional cash economy for a long time, since Spanish times. They were working in mines, they were part of this, uh, they were working on ranches, they were doing this. So, so it wasn't um, so revolutionary and new for everyone. Um, furthermore, far more Apaches and Yavapais at San Carlos in the 1870s and 80s and 90s worked on ranches, in mines, on roads, on dam projects uh, than ever scouted. Way more people worked. And so uh, scouting was just one economic act activity among many that our people had access to during this time. It was a, there was a constell constellation of, of new economic activities and some of them not so new. Um, furthermore, working at, a, at mines or roads or in white households as uh, domestic labor, um, it was often seasonal work and our Apache people and Yavapai people incorporated those types of jobs into already existent seasonal migrations and forms of labor. Um, and it was seen as something you did for a season and then you moved on to the next thing. Um, and, and if you think about scouting in that way, it would have been incorporated into those already existing frameworks. And, and our people would have understood scouting uh, within those frameworks that already existed. So if you take, for example, traditional Apache agricultural practices, while, while Apaches were mobile people um, migrating seasonally to, to resource areas, we would return to farming plots where um, you know, we would work. And not everyone in Apache society owned farmland, but those who did, um, or, or those who couldn't own land or didn't have access to it, they would often work for those who did. And they would work on their farming plots and have access to um, the produce that came from that. And uh, John Rope, who was a famous scout that worked with Grenville Goodwin, he said, when planting his field, the owner hired some men to help him. He paid these workers with cooked corn and would tell them to bring baskets or pots so that they could divide and take it home. Um, so in addition, while, while scouting and other forms of wage labor brought sorely needed money and access to goods, 
scouts largely didn't, didn't, wouldn't have viewed such access as an opportunity to accumulate or, or hoard wealth. That's another thing. Um, in traditional society, you're not, it's not how much you have, it's how much you can give out to other people. And so the people who had access to the goods were generous with those goods and would give them out. Um, this John Rope, again, that I just mentioned, when he was telling Grenville Goodwin about the time that he received his pay at Fort Thomas after one of his scout enlistments, he said he got $47. And he said, this money we divided up among our relatives. That's the way we used to do it in those days. Take care of our relatives by giving them clothes and grub. The Indians around here don't do it like that now. So scouting um, is put into old patterns of labor uh, and of community, of sustaining communities. Um, now that's not, I don't wanna say that, you know, Apaches and Yavapais were somehow like proto-capitalists. You know, that's, that's not what I'm getting at here, but I'm saying that, um, that it was something so new and revolutionary that they couldn't understand it other than uh, as, as a job that paid money. Um, I, think, I think that our people were far more savvy than that and understood it within Apache frameworks as well. Um, so this, this leads me to my next point about um, why men scouted. Some assert that our people did it because it gave them an opportunity to continue a, a certain lifestyle, that they were in the field, uh, that they got to be outdoors, that they got to carry a gun uh, when our people were, you know, imprisoned on reservations. And, and I don't think that that's untrue either. I think that there's truth to that. But if we reduce motivations for scouting to being about a desire to maintain sort of, maintain sort of a stereotypical uh, Apache or Yavapai lifestyle of, of you know, the wild and free Indian, then we're missing a lot of important points. Um, we have to see scouting within a framework of, of raiding and warfare in order to truly understand it. And um, if you look, for example, at uh, certain, certain books like uh, Big Sycamore Stands Alone, which is a, a history of um, our Vipa Apaches, the author said Apache warfare was a quote, calculated precise endeavor, but it was flexible enough to allow for adaptation to new experiences uh, and the dissemination of new information. I'm gonna take my coat off because now it's getting warm up here. So in, in the most general terms, uh, and using Keith Basso and Grenville Goodwin as well, their, their work on Western Apache raiding and warfare, um, Western Apaches distinguished between raiding, which was an activity to, to search out and take enemy property, um, and warfare, which was to take death from an enemy. Raiding was to take things, primarily livestock, and warfare was to avenge the death of a kinsman or a family member. Time and again, as, as I've read the accounts of scouts, and, um, and their statements even, and, and interviews with ethnographers during the early 1900s, scouting is framed within that model of acceptable raiding and warfare activities. So in addition to pay, scouts were frequently allowed to take spoils on campaigns. They could take um, livestock, they could take items that included you know, horses, tools, and material goods. And scouting was also integrated into the longstanding captive trade. Scouts took captives. Uh, if you read those accounts, um, for example, Geronimo took uh, you know, women from and girls from bands that were at San Carlos and then brought them out when they were in during some of their you know, breakouts, as they were called. Um, and those captives then were sought out by scouts who were sent to, uh, to get Geronimo. Um, John Rope, when he was recalling about the Sierra Madre campaign in 1883, he said he had taken a girl um, a girl captive from Chiricahua's and he gave her to another scout who then gave her to another scout still. And that scout began to sing a victory dance. And, and John Rope said, this is the song of thanks that they used to sing long ago when a successful war party came back and they gave the victory dance in which men and women danced together. So scouting is involved in, in traditional activities but also in, in captive taking and you see this happen. Um, and Rope really couldn't put it any clearer than when he said, we were scouts in order to help the whites against the Chiricahuas because they had killed a lot of our people. Um, tragically, this is, you know, this is a time of violence. This is the time of, of Apaches being pitted against one another because of the, inf the influx of settlers and the US Army. Um, so it, it was a confluence of all of these things. It was, yes, the maintenance, the continuation of a certain type of lifestyle, um, 
the, the uh, new economic opportunities, but scouting was always, always had to be understood within traditional frameworks of warfare and raiding. Um, so now I'm gonna fast forward and talk about scouting and its meanings after the wars are over. Uh, you know, Geronimo's final surrender is in 1886 when Warm Springs, Chiricahua peoples are um, taken captive and they're sent to uh, Florida and then they end up in, in Oklahoma at Fort Sill. Uh, fighting generally subsided after that and after that final surrender in 1886. Uh, but there were other, there were flare ups of violence after that as well. Um, but by this time, the army wasn't actively trying to keep our people at San Carlos anymore. And Dilje, Apaches, and Yavapai started to stream back north into the Verde Valley uh, to places like Fossil Creek, Tonto Creek, the Payson area around Prescott. And in many of the major developments in these communities that start to reform, scouts play a crucial role. They're the leaders of the communities in many cases. Um, and they're also leaders in places like San Carlos and White River. It's not just in, in the Verde Valley, but the Verde Valley is the place that I'm most familiar with. So one of the keys to understanding the legacy of scout service is the scout pension. And, and many of you might've heard of the pension. A lot of the former scouts drew army pensions. They were eligible um, for pensions. And there's this episode where they're about to embark on the Sierra Madre campaign in 1883. And General Crook says to the group of Apache scouts as assembled, he says, I'm the man in charge of all this outfit. And now I'm going to sign my name on this paper so that even, even if I get killed, the president will still know about what we all did and the record won't be lost. Thus, no matter if I die or live, the government will know that it must reward you. Uh, and a lot of these scouts who had served in these campaigns took this promise to heart and they asked for that reward later on in the decades following and in, into the 1900s. So by an act of Congress in 1917, scouts were first eligible for pensions of $20 a month. Um, and then the, the amount was raised when the acts were amended, went up to $30 and eventually, uh, it was $50 per month. That was the maximum you, you could receive as a former scout. Um, and in the years after the wars, which were lean years for our people, I mean, these are the hard times in the early part of the 1900s, um, scouts and their pensions were crucial to communities. Uh, they were used for groceries, for, for food, for um, survival. And scout pensions weren't also just paid to scouts, they were paid to dependents and widows. Uh, and they became a source of, of uh, what sustained our communities at those times. And so I wanna give a few examples of scout veterans who received pensions. One was uh, Dietle, who was the dreamer, also known as Henry Irving. He was a, a Dilje Apache from the Fossil Creek area. And he actually had several homes that he, or cabins that he kept, one in Payson, uh, which became sort of the, the gathering place for, for Apaches in that area, but also at Christopher Creek and, and Tonto Creek at that confluence at Fossil Creek, but also at Camp Verde, he lived there for a time. And he supported family members in all of those locations. His pension helped uh, family members in, in all those places. And like I said, his home in Payson became the gathering place for Dilje Apaches there. He owned his homestead, which was uh, he received through scout service right there. It was at Indian Hill in Payson now. Um, and it's not uh, in their possession anymore. When he died, um, his, the documentation was, was buried with him. And uh, the, the other relatives didn't know that they had to pay taxes on the land because he had owned it um, in fee simple. And so eventually they lost the land because uh, they didn't pay the property tax. Um, but it was his grandson, who was Milton Chief Campbell, some of you may have known him, uh, who helped bring, uh, he, he helped, helped win federal recognition for Apaches in Payson in 1972 through a congressional action. Um, but it was Henry Irving and his you know, persistence uh, and his leadership in, among that, that community that helped uh, Dilje Apaches in, in Payson survive that period. There was a group of uh, former Indian scouts at Fort McDowell, close to here, Yavapai Scouts. And uh, you know their names are prominent in the history. One of them was known as Yuma Frank. He was the leader of that group at Fort McDowell. Um, he had been a scout sergeant. Also the Dickens brothers, George and Charles Dickens. Um, 
who were scouts as well, and, and Thomas Sarama. So these four were crucial at Fort McDowell when, um, when the, again, those restrictions were eased and the Yavapai is at San Carlos started to move back to Fort McDowell, which is near here um, at the confluence of the Salt and Verde River. It was former scouts who went to Washington, D.C. and lobbied the president there. And in 1903, President uh, Theodore Roosevelt signed an executive order that created the reservation at Fort McDowell for Yavapais. And it was largely the actions of these uh, former scouts. And so, you know, they're, they're, they were prominent people in their community. Um, after Yuma Frank died, uh, George Dickens became the leader of the community. Uh, Charles Dickens owned a general store, operated a general store there at Fort McDowell. So you know, th they weren't the only leaders, but they're doing important work in, in keeping this community and sustaining this community. Um, one among our people in Camp Verde area was Ismaili, who's also known as Captain Smiley or Major Smiley. He was called Smiley because his Apache name sounded like Smiley. And so the, the soldiers who were lazy and couldn't pronounce the actual Apache just started calling him Smiley. Um, and he was a leader among our people. And uh, this is a photo of him many years later when he's an elderly man posing with the rifle. Uh, he was a respected member of the community, but also uh, a respected member of the the larger Camp Verde community. And that's no small thing. If you know the history of Camp Verde, uh, this is what you see when you walk, when you drive into town, that's the monument in Camp Verde. So it, it says everything kind of about the community, uh, uh, American flag and a cannon. And it's very tied into this identity of the location of the fort. And, and they have Fort Verde days and, and this celebration of, of um, US Army culture during the Indian Wars, which was you know, existed to subdue and, and kill our people. But Smiley was respected in that community and he acted as a go-between. He really uh, used his sort of diplomatic skills and his knowledge that he had gained. He was a uh, scout sergeant as well uh, to endear himself to the, to the community there. But despite the fact that these men who I've been talking about were leaders in their communities and they were respected both inside and outside their communities. Um, there's a part of this that we don't recognize these men as veterans. Um, they're, they're almost never referred to as veterans. They're just former scouts. But when you think about it, they were, they were military veterans. While they served often shorter enlistments, many of them served five, six enlistments in their lifetime. So if you're serving for three or six months, multiply that by six and you've served just as much as a US Army regular who served a three year enlistment. Um, and as I've looked through the documents and looked through the scout records, you can see a very clear effort on the part of the federal government to deny these men their pensions in particular, to deny them any kind of uh, monetary compensation for the labor that they did, for the, the assistance that they gave. Um, we hear about you know, forgotten veterans and the problems with the Veterans Administration in our news cycle now. Well, uh, these were truly forgotten veterans in many, way, uh, in many ways. Um, take, for example, uh, a Yavapai scout by the name of Jim Casey, who had served uh, as a scout, um, also known as Manya, that was his Yavapai name. I found his record and there is a, uh, his medical examination that he received when he was a scout. Uh, he, uh, he, he filed for a, a pension in 1923 and it was rejected. Um, and he, you know, there were further claims over the following years. Um, this medical examination is in 1928, which showed that he was around 80 years of age, found that he was hunched over, suffered from trachoma, had an enlarged heart and moderate uh, arteriosclerosis, suffered from chronic bronchitis, and had a large and painful abdominal hernia. Yet he was not deemed worthy of a pension. Uh, and it took multiple mm -hmm. applications before he finally got one. Um, his pension was, was awarded, but like I said, it took years. He filed in 1923. He died 10 years later in 1933. And um, get this, when his daughter Ada, which is my daughter's name, Ada, when she filed for a claim for burial expenses, the reply was sent to Fort McDowell, California, which doesn't exist. They sent it to the wrong place, I think on purpose, because they didn't want to pay for burial expenses. This man, who was clearly a disabled veteran, had served multiple enlistments, 
the, the federal government and the Bureau of Pensions did everything it could to keep him from receiving a pension. Uh, there were several uh, claims filed by Henry Irving, who I'd mentioned earlier. Um, one was in 1924, he sought a disability payment for a gunshot wound to the left knee and rheumatism after, and also for an injury to the left eye that impaired his sight. You can see it in the photo, his left eye, that he, he had his vision impaired because of an injury he'd suffered as a scout. Both were rejected. And the, the, the rejection notice says, quote, on the ground that there is no record in the War Department of this injury, and you are manifestly unable to furnish evidence connecting any present disability from these causes with your military service in the line of duty. Um, they said, the burden's on you. Show us the papers from when you were in the field. And everyone knows that scouts, you know, they didn't keep uh, all this documentation. Um, while eventually he, he received a pension, like many other applicants, it took years and persevering through a number of rejections. Uh, and I believe that the Bureau of Pensions, again, they banked on our people just giving up and not persisting, which many of them uh, did though. And they, they kept at it for years, but they were trying to starve out our communities. They just were wanting us to disappear and go away. Um, even the, the famous scouts were not exempt. For example, Nana Alchese, who was the wife of William Alchese, she had her widow's pension application denied. Um, they said that you hadn't become his wife before 1917 or you couldn't show proof that you were. And so uh, they weren't gonna do it. Sometimes it, it literally took extraordinary efforts by individuals to secure a scout's pension. For example, the uh, aforementioned George Dickens, his uh, pension was denied several times, um, and he received finally a $50 per month pension when Senator Carl Hayden wrote to the Bureau of Pensions personally in his behalf. Uh, but not once, he actually wrote six times, six letters I've found from Carl Hayden to the Bureau of Pensions saying, I know this guy, I know he was a scout, give him his pension over a two year period. And finally, he was awarded a pension. Um, so again, uh, you see this spilling over from the Indian Wars when it's, it's violence and genocide then, and then it's, it's just trying to get rid of our people still in whatever way uh, that the, the federal government can. But I wanna conclude with the case of Captain Smiley that I mentioned before, also known as Major Smiley. Again, he's a well-known leader uh, among the Camp Verde Yavapai Apache community. And he began uh, inquiring after a pension as early as 1919. So he was a little ahead of the curve compared to some from, from the area. Now, while there's no question that he served as a scout, he also apparently liked to tell stories. He, he was a, a storyteller about himself and about his service. He claimed to be chief of the Tonto Apaches. He would say that. Um, he also claimed to have personally captured Geronimo. He said he was one of the two scouts that captured Geronimo, which was, was not true. Those two scouts were Chiricahuas. It, was, um, uh, you know, it, was, it wasn't him. Um, he also, like I said, was referred to sometimes as either Captain or Major Smiley. Um, there were no commissioned scouts as officers. They, the highest rank you could get was Sergeant. So he, there's no way he could have been a major unless he just sort of created that rank for himself. So he might've just made it up. Uh, he, he had a medal that he wore around and he said that it was awarded from uh, the federal government as a, as a reward for his service in capturing Geronimo. Um, there were some who claimed that he actually had a, a lawyer in Jerome make the medal for him and that he would just wear it around. So, I'm not interested really particularly in whether that's true or not. I mean, some of it's clearly not true and like the capturing Geronimo personally, it wasn't him. But what I am interested in is this. Um, while it's, in, it's entirely possible that he had a distinguished career as a scout, that he served multiple enlistments, that he did uh, important things, that he was on these Geronimo campaigns and participated, um, all of that, is important, but what's more important is if we look at this man as somebody who recognized the value of scout service and the value of getting you know, white people to believe a little bit more, um, hey, I personally captured Geronimo, here's a medal that proves it, you know, all of this. Um, what he was doing was leveraging that scout service and maybe a little larger than life tales to get his community a little bit more respect 
and to uh, make things a little easier in a place where life was not easy, this place, Camp Verde, where you know, the community was racist and, and worked against the interests of our people and even tried to remove us after we returned. Um, if he was exaggerating, okay. You know, he was, he was playing the coyote. He was doing it to help his family and community at a time when most whites would have rather just them disappear, um, but they wouldn't do that. And so I'm gonna end there. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming out tonight. So there's time now uh, for questions, if anyone has any, and I'll just, um, I think we have microphones. Maybe somebody can, if you have a question, raise your hand, we can bring the microphone to you and then I'll just answer it from here. Uh, if you have even things that I didn't talk about, if you, things that you wanna discuss, um, I'm happy to take questions. If I don't know the answer, I'll just tell you so, but uh, I'm happy to take questions from anyone. Thanks. For purposes of this talk, you kind of lumped together the occupied Apache, and certainly there was overlap, particularly there in Central Arizona. Right. But they were different people, different, yeah. uh, different uh, ethnic groups, different language, different culture. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. Yeah. Particularly at this time period. So uh, Yavapais and Apaches speak different languages, they're not in the same language family. Um, Again, like I said, Yavapais were long uh, misidentified and called other things like Yuma Apache or, or um, Mojave Apache. When the reality is Yavapais speak a language that's more similar to Hualapai and Havasupai human languages. And then Apaches speak uh, Athabascan language that's more related to other uh, Apache dialects and Navajo. So linguistically, they're different. Culturally, there are some similarities. There's, there's some similarity in the material culture, but like you said, they're, they're different. The practices are different. The beliefs and the stories, there's, at times there's some similarities, but then there, there are significant differences. Um, in the Verde Valley, generally speaking, the, the Verde River was the dividing line between the two. To the west is Yavapai territory, to the east is Apache territory. Um, but again, these are not, neither group is a monolith. And so we're talking about many bands and, and Yavapais subdivide into at least four regional groups. So you have those that are around uh, Fort McDowell, which is one group. And then you have those in the Verde Valley, uh, Prescott Yavapais as well. And then there's a, um, a Southwestern Yavapai group. So, um, and then when we're talking about Apache, Western Apaches, there are numerous groups of Western Apaches, San Carlos Apaches, White River, um, our Vipa Apaches, Doge, which is the, the Northern, also known as Tonto Apaches uh, in the Verde Valley. Um, and so again, like you said, they are distinct and separate people. But the, the reason that I included so much of both is because I think that when we look at the, the history of the scouts, um, Yavapais aren't recognized enough for their scout service. Uh, we know about the Apache scouts, um, but you don't hear about Yavapai scouts as much when there weren't as many of them, but there weren't as many Yavapais as Apaches, period. So, but they did serve in large numbers. And the last Congressional Medal of Honor was given in 1890 for a scout, and it was a scout by the name of Rowdy, who was a Yavapai. And that was the last one that was awarded. Rowdy was a, was a Yavapai scout in 1890 for an action at, at uh, um, uh, Turkey Creek, or is it, I can't, can't remember the name, but th that was the last Congressional Medal of Honor given and it was to a Yavapai scout. And so I just wanna sort of make a little corrective that both were involved and that when we talk about Apache scouts, we really need to say Yavapai Apache scouts because it was both. Other questions? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Would you consider sharing your story about being a renegade, um, acting as a renegade to teach the legal society how to try to find the renegades? And the reason I commented that I would say that because it's new and it's living on the land, I think once in many years. They knew it. They 
Yeah. Are you, are you talking about when he was at Fort Grant and yes. they, so this is a, this is a family question from a family, a family member. Um, the question is, would I talk about how my grandfather was used basically uh, to train dogs and lawmen uh, when he was at Fort Grant, he was a, a juvenile offender and, and was put at Fort Grant for a time uh, to serve at what was, they called it the boys ranch. You know, he was down there at the boys ranch because he got in trouble. And so they would, he told the story that they would turn him loose and basically said, we're going to give you a little bit of time and you run away and try and shake us. And then we'll try to find you. And uh, so they would sick the dogs out to find him and he would, you know, be successful. He, they wouldn't be able to find him or, or it would take them a long time. And he was a kid, you know, he was a teenager or younger. He went a couple, he had a couple terms where he was at the boys ranch, but um, the, the reason that he was successful at that is because he knew the land again. He knew, just like our people knew this territory, they knew every, every canyon, every, you know, inch of that land, because you grow up in it and you, you know that, that place so well. And when he was a kid and escaped from uh, Truxton Canyon Indian School, it's just a boy and ran away from up there at Peach Springs and made his way all the way down to Migas Mountain. He was crossing over. Uh, and that's not a short distance and it's not easy terrain either, but him and his friend ran away and were able to traverse all of that because they knew the land. Um, and that's, Part of, again, why scouts were so successful. And Crook knew that. He knew the only way to catch people in this land is to use those people who know the land because they, they didn't know it. They couldn't do it. Any other questions? We got one in the back and one in the front. And sorry. Okay. Yes, there's no questions online. Sure. Well, it's a two part question. It says, have you, have you ever visited Turk Peak Battle Site? And when Apaches are camped for the moves, St. Carlos, how did they fare on the journey and that's what St. Carlos after, yeah. afterward? Um, yeah. Okay. Do I need to repeat it or is, did you already get it? I do need to repeat it. Okay. So the question was, have I visited the Turret Peak battle site? Um, I have not. I've driven by the area, but I haven't been up uh, there. Um, I would say in answer to that, I don't, we're not really fans of going to places where massacres happened. Um, you know, I don't, I don't wanna go where I know a lot of my ancestors were killed. It's, it's painful. It's not a, it's not a, uh, a happy thing to do. Um, the second part is how did our people fare when they were marched from the Verde Valley to San Carlos? And the answer is not well, it was, it was rough. It was not an easy march. And, Every year we do a commemoration in February to commemorate when we were allowed to return from there. And we do, we sort of recreate that march and we have a run where there's runners that run overnight the entire distance from San Carlos to Camp Verde. And then they meet the community in the morning and they come together. Uh, but our people, you know, a lot of them died. A lot of them, some drowned in the rivers because um, the army refused to take trails that were easier, they, they said, do it as the crow flies. You have to go straight over the mountains. And if there are rivers in the way, and this is February, the water's cold, if the rivers are high, they made us you know, go straight through. And so people, people drowned, people froze, people died. And then there was also fighting be between Yavapais and Apaches who you know, were just, um, they, were, they were at the end of their uh, ability to, to be patient in that situation. So there was some fighting and some violence between the two groups along the way, but it wasn't, it was a terrible experience. Every tribe probably has a, a trail of tears, some, some sort of forced march with it, in which our, you know, a lot of people died. And this was one, this was our example. This was our trail of tears, basically. So there was a question in the back. Hello, thank you for acknowledging the Yavapai um, scouts per se and the separation of the two with the Yavapai and the Apache. Mm -hmm. But my question is kind of um, with the Yavapai land, uh, I noticed that you marked out when was that map, if you can go back. Sure. When was that? Um, right there. 
Yeah. That was 1895. So the, the map date that's, I don't know if there's a map on there. Um, the Rio Verde Reserve was 71 to 75. And so that was the very first one that General Crook had promised right. the young white people. And, 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 and Apaches as well. And Apaches. Yeah. But there were there were separate camps. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then we church tracks the right. roads and right. came back and then we we're kind of like in a checkerboard. Yeah, yeah. That's because when we came back, um, all of the good all of the so the question was about this map when it when when was this reservation in existence and um, then sort of what happened when our people went back. Um, our reservation does not look like this. It's not 800 square miles. It's not even close. I mean, we have a few hundred acres. That's it. And it's non-contiguous land. So it's a little plot at Middle Verde, a little plot in Camp Verde, Tunley, Rimrock, and Clarkdale. And they're, they're tiny and they're spread over the Verde Valley. And that's because when our people came back, we'd been gone 25 years, essentially. All the best lands were occupied. The ranchers came in, the farmers, the settlers, everyone came and took the land. And so when we came back, we were basically squatters on our own territory. We were squatters in our own lands. But we went back to places where we had been previously. And so there were, that's why there were Yavapais in Clarkdale, because they went back to the same place where they had been before and, and you know, Apaches in, in Camp Verde. So um, but we sort of were on the margins. That's how I've always heard it explained. That when we came back after 1900, our people lived in the nooks and crannies wherever they could find a place, whether they were squatting on like Phelps Dodge land or they were um, United Verde Copper Company land. Uh, and eventually through persistence, we, we got a handful of plots. But like you said, today we're just sort of checkerboarded and it's a very tiny amount of territory. When it should have been at least this big but that promise was broken. We have, let's see, three more that I see. Oh, okay, we got another online question, sure. Uh, has there been a change in the statistics of the number of generations? Um, I think so. Uh, the question is whether there's been a change of in, an increase in interest among a younger generation about scouts. I think so because Scouts make a good uh, popular culture in it. Out with the, the attire and the red headband, which was sort of the uniform of the scouts carrying the rifle. It's an iconic image. And so uh, even the image that was used on the, the flyer for this event, you know, a bunch of scouts standing in line with their rifles in the air. Um, there's just something iconic about that. And so I think there's um, some identification among Apache groups that I've seen with that image. Um, and you know, again, the fighting scouts, maybe it, it goes along with that, you know, the scouts. Uh, so, so that they can coexist at the same time. I mean, like Geronimo is an easy figure to identify with as sort of a cultural hero because he, he fought against as long as he could and he, he held out. But then scouts are also um, can be identified with. And so I've seen it in like skateboard graphics and, and things like that. You see, you see scout imagery sometimes. Um, so I think that there's some increased interest. We'll see. I'm a scholar and I'm not particularly young either. I mean, I'm in my, I mean, I'm in my forties, which to my kids is like ancient, but um, I hope that there'll be more interest. Oh yeah, generated. Julian's been waiting a while, but we'll, sorry, we can get them all. Thank you. Please, Martin. So I um, actually have two questions about the um, sure. So first, uh, you know, lots of the things have looked at how African Americans and Mexican Americans and Americans joined the army and used the military service to like a way to you know, make claims to citizenship. Needed mm -hmm. um, Mexican citizenship. Um, and you know, it might be a lot of difficult, but I'm wondering, you know, do you think there's a way for is there a way in which citizenship, even if it's a soft and like simple society, somehow in the US, um, plays a role at all? Right. And then the second question is do you, is there any way to explain the work you see being performed by the Mexicans, the young Mexicans, and perhaps the youth on reservations? 
Yeah. Sure. It's a good question. Two questions. One about citizenship. Were uh, where does citizenship enter into this conversation? Did they leverage scout service for citizenship? Um, generally, I don't see that this much. I mean, a lot of these guys were by 1924 when the Indian Citizenship Act is passed. A lot of them were old. A lot of them had died before that. Um, you know, the, the exceptions were those who lived into the 1930s and beyond. Henry Irving was like 101 when he died. So, um, so I don't know if, if it was as important a motivator. I think more important was just helping these communities exist and, and stay solvent and stay together. Um, and citizenship could have been a concern. Mike Burns, who I mentioned, he was, a, he was a citizen, but he went through a process before 1924 where he had to be declared competent and then have his papers directly from the, the Interior Department, from the, from the Secretary of the Interior. So there were ways to do it. And sometimes scouts availed themselves. And I'm only talking about Apache and Yavapai scouts. There were other scouts, you know, there were Pawnee scouts, there were um, Seminole scouts, there were many um, indigenous people who served as scouts, but I don't see it as much with Apaches and Yavapais. Uh, and then the second question was uh, Indian police, like how, how are they part of this conversation? A lot of these, there was crossover. There, there were guys who were Indian policemen, like Smiley was an Indian policeman. Um, and then others who, who served terms as both scouts and as police. So John Clum's police force, you know, the famous reservation police force, some of them had been scouts and then transitioned into that role. And some of them were scouts after. What's a little different is Indian police are operating on the reservation to sort of keep an eye on things. Um, and scouts generally were, were outside of the reservation and used in the field and in places, but sorry, there were um, also, there were also uh, the army used sort of spies and they would as sort of informants. So scouts who, or, or men who kind of served that role of being informants in their community and sort of keeping an eye on things and then going back to the army, that, that happened as well. Um, or, so there were different le levels of activity. It wasn't all just scouting in the field or Indian police work on reservation. There was also some sort of like espionage type elements, I guess you would say. Um, but between scouts and Indian police, I think there was some crossover. In particular, Clum's force, which he uses to like, when they go into, they leave, you know, San Carlos and go to White River to sort of like demand that, um, whatever uprising that's happening there is put down and Clem is sort of, sing, he's, he's credited with single-handedly putting this down with his Indian police force. Uh, but I, I see some crossover there. There's definitely um, some crossover. There was a question here. Yeah. And, and behind a couple rows after. Thank you. Earlier you mentioned Spanish. Yeah. Are yeah. there Parallel to the Mexican era, uh, where there's scouting of scouts. Sure. Mexican army. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it 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 existed throughout all three colonial eras, from the Spanish to the Mexican to the to the American period, which I would so put it. Um. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know in terms of, um, you know, I don't think that you could. Um, there was the Pima Company, which was famous during the Spanish period, and uh, they served out of the, the um, Spanish installations in southern Arizona and northern, northern Sonora and Mexico. Um, and they had recognition, and, and some of them were, were accepted as community members. But I mean, Spanish citizenship is, a, is more loosely defined. It's not as um, like with American citizenship, where you, you, know, you get citizen papers from the Department of Interior. It wasn't exactly that same you know, type of fixed process. But scout demands or demands to serve as auxiliaries was a cause of um, dispute, like among Yaquis, for example, who they were asked to scout and, and serve in auxiliary units against Apaches to the north and didn't want to do it. And that was one of the reasons for a, a Yaqui conflict with, with colonial Spain. 
Um, so it, it led to you know, disputes as well. Um, but like I said, Apaches served for Spain at time, or I mean, uh, yeah, the, the Apaches de Paz, the uh, peaceful Apaches around Tucson were sort of a, a group that was seen as allies of the Spanish crown. Um, but like I said, it's a, it's a tradition as old as colonialism to use indigenous people against other indigenous people. But what's a little bit different during the, the Apache Yavapai wars is that Apaches are used against other Apaches and Yavapais against other Apaches. And that, I think that marks it as a little bit, a little bit different. Um, whereas Othams have been used against Apaches. In this case, Apaches sometimes were used against you know, not your own band of Apaches, but sometimes against your own band of Apaches. The two Chiricahua scouts who tracked down Geronimo, they were Chiricahuas. And they were sent to Fort Marion along with the rest of the band, even after they had helped bring Geronimo in in 1886, they were, they were sent there as well. So we got one more up here and then Doug has a question down here. Yeah. Sure. So the question was about sort of the the Hollywood depiction, but then also the the literature, which sometimes leads to believe that all Apache scouts, everyone was sent back to Florida. I mean, the groups, the bands that were sent to Florida were specifically Chiricahua and Warm Springs people, uh, and uh, including um, scouts who had, who had served in the, in the Geronimo campaigns in the 1880s. Um, but, you know, our, I mean, Dilje, Tonto Apache scouts, also Yavapais, mm -hmm. Um, White Mountain Apache Scouts, San Carlos Apache Scouts, they weren't sent to Fort Marion. It was specifically those who had been part of Geronimo's bands because they were seen as like the, the most um, hostile, the most dangerous uh, after so many so-called breakouts. So they were the ones that were specifically targeted. And, the, and it's, you know, it's unfortunate that those who had scouted and they, and if you read the scout, um, the interviews that are done later in the early 1900s with these men. And they, you know, it's like, sort of like, why did you go against your own people? And they just said, well, we were, every time our people would leave the reservation and then the army would crack down on the reservation and life was miserable for us. And so we just wanted them to come in. We just wanted the, the people to come back to the reservation so that we could have a measure of peace. And so they were willing to do that. And so um, again, you would think that the, the federal government would have recognized those efforts, but they shipped scouts as well. Those who had assisted in bringing Geronimo in were sent along with Geronimo to, to uh, Fort Marion and then you know, they're in Alabama and then they're in Fort Sill today. And some of them have come back to Mescalero Reservation, some of them from New Mexico as well. But we had a question up, up front, a couple. So the question is how I got information on the scouts. Um, some of it is community or information. I mean, people here that I've talked to, like um, our, our cultural people in, in our culture departments, uh, Gertie Smith is one, and Vincent Randall is another who. Um, keep a lot of that knowledge, have a lot of that knowledge about the scouts. So I've had, you know, spent time talking, hearing the stories. There are also family stories that I've heard. I mean, these are things that I have heard since I was young and, and know about. Um, the records in particular come from scout pension files, which are generally from the 19 teens, 20s, 30s. And those are fairly in depth. And those are through the National Archives and Records Administration. You can access those. So I've looked at hundreds of scout pension files to see um, because they, there's, they're very you know, formulaic. They have forms that you have to fill out and, and specific information. So it's like, who are you? Where were you born? Who, who did you serve with? Can you name any of the white officers you've served with? And a lot of them would say like, oh yeah, I remember Chafee and, and Britton uh, uh, Davis. And I remember uh, Lieutenant Schuyler. Like you see certain names 
popped up again and again. And, and um, who was your scout sergeant? And then we'll name the sergeant, whoever was the, the Indian sergeant of their company. There are affidavits from white community members because it's not enough that Indians say uh, we were scouts and their their family members can attest to that. It's like we have to get some blue, some trustworthy white people to say so as well. And so you see that there will be you know interviews with white community members, and it's always kind of the same few people in Camp Verde. It's like the the Wingfields and a few others who, you know. Um, they owned a store and, and it's kind of funny you see these and it's like oh yes i knew this guy he was a good indian he was one of the good ones you know <laughs> um it wasn't again it wasn't enough that we could say like we were scouts you know and and it's funny because uh burke and crook as well like the, i've read statements where they're like uh, an indian never lies under oath if you ask them a direct question they don't they don't lie i mean they might tell you an answer in a way that you might not understand but that's sort of an, an indian way of answering a question and but if a if a guy said he was a scout he was a scout you know they, they were they they could remember the the campaigns and all this and time and again when they're denied and then they go back at the records one of the problems is uh, scouts didn't have the same name when they were an old man as they had when they were a kid. You know, you might have three, four or five different names throughout your lifetime, depending on what stage in your life you were at. And so when a guy enlisted when he was 18 for the first scout service term, he gave a certain name. Well, when he's an 83 year old trying to file for a pension, he might have a totally different name and he gives his name then. And they, well, we don't find your name in the records or or it had been transcribed by some clerk way back 50 years previous who didn't know Apache at all or Yavapai and couldn't write it. And so, so there were language elements as well, but generally in all these records, you find that if they said they were a scout, they were a scout. Um, yeah. I have another question up front to... We have a moment. Okay, sure. Uh, is there any documentation from Crook explaining how he reconciled his respect to the Yavapai scouts? Yeah, the reservation. yeah. Um, one thing I also want to say about Crook is the, uh, he had a few, like the native people had a few names for him. Apaches had a name for him. I figured what it was, but the Yavapais at uh, Rio Verde called him old woman face because he, he sort of had little beady eyes and was really wrinkly. And so they, that's what they called him. Old woman face was their name for Crook. Um, I, I think that he didn't, I don't think that he felt any moral dilemma about that. The question was whether Crook felt, you know, conflicted about the fact that he admired Yavapai and Apache scouts and, you know, Al Chase was his friend and he wrote a mule named Apache, but the fact that he still put them on reservations. I do think he felt bad when he had to go back on his word because um, he had made a promise and, and then he made another promise. Okay, I'm sorry that you have to do this, but if you go to San Carlos and are good there, then you can come home soon. I think he felt bad about that because there was a sense of like honor that he had lied, but I don't think that he felt a moral dilemma that he, that he was an Indian fighter and killer and also was friendly with Indian people. I think that he, um, and respected the, the accounts that I've read is generally the scouts respected Crook, um, because he was more or less, he was honest, uh, if you read their accounts that Sieber was highly respected, that's not true. Um, and Al Sieber, who was the chief of scouts, died in an accident on a road working with former scouts. And the suspicion is, and the things that I've heard is that they intentionally pushed some rocks down on him. They killed him. He was crushed in a road accident. So um, if you ever hear like, oh, Al Sieber was so well respected by the scouts, that's, that's not really true. But I think it really was. But to answer that question, the simplest way, I don't think he felt any, any moral dilemma about killing Indians and loving Indians. Yeah. What's that? Final question. Okay, can we give it to Doug? Sorry, I saw him raise his hand. So, so after all the work the scouts do, and then the Yavapais get sent to St. Carlos for 25 years, and during that 25 years, um, white people get to take their land, why do you think they were treated so bad when they came back and couldn't even get pension? I mean, what do you think? Since you are the other party, I think you yeah. have <laughs> So I think that it, uh, um, first of all, when, when 
Yavapais and Apaches, Dilje Apaches and Yavapais went back to this area after 1900. Um, there are a series of efforts by white Camp Verdeans in particular to get us moved back again to San Carlos. Uh, and they say, move them back. Um, and they use excuses like, uh, they're, they're in too close proximity with us and they're diseased and our people are going to get sick by being near Indians. And so to answer your question, I think it's just good old fashioned Indian hating. I mean, it's, it's, I hate to say it that bluntly for something, or I don't hate to say it. I'll just be honest. Uh, it's, it's racism and Indian hating. That's what happened. That's, that's what's going on there. And that's what still goes on there. in, in many instances, I mean, you see it in these border communities, right? Um, and I think that uh, certain men got respect for their scout service, uh, but it often wasn't enough um, for the, it certainly wasn't enough to get us all of, our, all of that land back or more, you know, that's just a tiny sliver of what was our territory. Uh, our territory was huge, it was vast compared to that. Um, but I think it's just that same legacy of, of genocide, racism, settler expansion, um, a hatred of Indians, Indian killing, you know, those, those things run deep. On that happy note, thanks for that question. This is the truth, this is the truth needs to be told. Yeah. Thanks, thanks to everybody for listening, appreciate it.